Porsche has always built cars for drivers who don't want to compromise. But even then, not all Porsches are created equal. And in the 1950s, if you wanted nothing but the nastiest, most badass Porsche there was, then this car, the 356 Carrera GT, was your baby. With a stove-hot engine and about double the horsepower of the cooking version of the 356, the Carrera GT was a hugely successful race car that, as was the fashion of the time, could be driven to the track, clean up the opposition and then carry the trophies home. And when you look at how it's all put together, you can see how it was a racer first and a road car second. Even in 1956, race cars didn't need luggage space. So, this one doesn't have any either. Instead of suitcases, it carries 85 litres of petrol. This car really is a fuel tank with headlights. Up the business end, the standard 356 Porsche's pushrod engine has been replaced by a double overhead cam engine and two of the biggest Weber carburetors I've ever seen. The end result was 135 horsepower, which in 56, when Elvis was still singing Jailhouse Rock, was really something else. The attention to detail in getting weight out of the car is pretty impressive too. Rather than have standard window winders, a leather strap does the job. turn a road car into a race car, you end up with a pretty compromised sort of road car. Throw in the fact that older cars generally impose their own limitations on how you use them, and you can see that this car really is equal parts pleasure and pain. The pedals are the old through the floor numbers, so you have to get used to that. And like every manual Porsche I've ever driven, the clutch is over centre, so it can be very easy to stall when you try and pull away in traffic. The gear shift is a beautiful slender little metal number, but even then the throws are huge. First gear is in another suburb to second gear. But the steer is very light, it's beautifully directed and, and nicely weighted. The engine doesn't really make much power below about 4,000 RPM, and that's purely because of the race tuning. So you need to get right up it if you want anything like maximum thrust. But if you do, the payoff is there. It really does get going at that point. But the thing that hits you right between the eyes, and I mean literally, is the noise this thing makes. It is deafening. The engine makes every kind of mechanical racket I think I've ever heard. And when you open the taps, those big Webbers open their butterflies, and at fair dinkum sounds like every piece of interior trim is about to be sucked into the engine. Another thing you notice pretty early on is that the cabin is tiny. If you had two guys my size in here, she'd be full. And I tell you what, they'd have to be pretty good mates. But is it fun? Uh, is it ever? These cars have always been one of my favourites of all time, and this one is the one to have. Even though I've driven it now. I don't know, there's just something about driving around in something this old, but in, in such good condition. I don't know, it, it puts a smile on your face, people stop to take photos of it, people want to talk to you about it. I guess if you're the shy, retiring type, you don't want a car like this. But if you were around in 1956 and you wanted to win races, attack twisty mountain roads on the weekend, and lure somebody like Grace Kelly into the jump seat, then you needed a 356 Carrera GT. Just remember not to let Gracie do any of the driving. Let's have a quick look at Sydney's Eastern Creek Raceway. It's just under four kilometres in length, 12 turns in all, and the cars race in an anti-clockwise direction. Spectacular circuit, heaps of elevation changes, and turn one is one of the fastest corners in Australia. Picking up the action for race number two, brought to us by Speedy Wheels. It's the Bianti Historics, and we're going to see some serious wheel action today with some of these onboard cameras, Mark. Yeah, it's just been amazing. I think we've got all the action covered here. One camera in Des Ball's car, the 67 Gagan Mustang, another one in Steve Mason's Camaro, a third in Robbie Braun's Valiant Charger, the hot Hemi 6. Fantastic field of cars. We've got more cameras back in the action. One with Jason Tilly. Now, Jason unfortunately snapped his gear shift in race one and has put him right to the back of the grid for race two. He's got a lot of work to do. 
A fantastic crowd in the house, Mark. People have responded to this formula, and look at Mason off the line. Fantastic start from the Chevy Camaro. Des Wall off pole position. Didn't quite get away as cleanly, and now he's got Rob Braun in his mirrors as they swing through turn one. One of the fastest corners in Australia. He's under attack from Russell Wright, just on the outside there in the Yellow Falcon. And you can see how hard Robbie's working here. Hard under brakes down into turn two. What a beautiful sound to listen to those onboards. Tirana right in the middle of the mix as well into turn number two. Plenty of tyres howling and that will only get worse as the race wears on. And that's an unusual sight there. You can see Tilly's Green Falcon right alongside is Paul Stubber, the fast man of Group NC Historics. He was late getting out for race one. That puts him to the back of the grid for race two. So both Tilly... And Stubber, watch from a charge from these two. I think that's only done a good thing for the standard of racing. Stubber is the wild man. Now have a look oh. at some of the moves through the field here. Tilly, as we look at our rare spares replay, it's like a scene from the movie Bullet here, Mark. Oh, look at Stubber just threading the needle backwards and forwards. Bit of racing room oh. through turn one. The tyres are cold. These cars are very twitchy. As they head down toward turn two. Oh, he has a go under brakes. Well, this Deeper. should be big. Deeper. <laughs> oh, three <laughs> wide. Just enough room for the big cars to get into turn two. Amazing stuff. Forget about the street price of some of these fantastic cars. Now the value. Des Wall really giving him a hard time now. This beautiful Mustang. Listen to it sing. Now the Shannon's in-car camera with Des Wall. A bit of history there. The 1967 Mustang driven by none other than Pete Gagan. Still racing today. Incredible. Here's the battle for the lead. Steve Mason in the big 350 cubic inch Chev Camaro leading... Des Wall onto the straight. Huge crowd at Eastern Creek today. Back with the Mount Panorama Resort in-car camera for Robert Braun, and you can see, oh, he's got a problem. Well, the car got very snaky coming off the top of the hill, so I'm not sure what the problem is. He got off the circuit momentarily. He was certainly fairly animated about it. Well, I was going to say the V8s maybe have oh. a, an advantage in a straight line. Look at this attack under brakes by Wall. He locks the inside wheel. Oh. And they've contacted too. Right in the middle of the turn. He had everything locked up there, just nudged into Mason's car, and he's taken the lead as a result. Back on board with Jason Tilly here, the Speedy Wheels, XY Falcon GTHO, and working really hard out of turn number two here. Capri in the crosshairs. Oh, look how hard he's working at that wheel. The big Hoosier crossfly tyres that these V8s run in this category, they really move and squirm around. Under power, here comes Tilly, that distinctive green Falcon. The reigning Bianti historic touring car champion in the hands of his older brother Brad last year. Let's have a look at the rear spares replay of that incident down at turn two. He's really, really deep. Then it locks up. He loses steering control and just a biff into the side of the Chevy Camaro. Appropriate we should take the Shannon's car insurance on board for that one as he goes in and just creases the left front quarter panel of that immaculate entry of, of Mason. Weight comes off the oh. inside wheel. She pinches. It's locked. Just not enough to... Arrest the speed. Just a bit of a nudge there between the two cars. So Mason gets back onto the track, but as a result, Wall has taken the lead. Now, Rob Braun, you saw he had some sort of Ooh. mechanical problem there coming onto the straight. Now let's have a look at the uh, rear spares replay. Maybe this will tell the story. Oh! Now, he's got some. Is that a flat tyre? I think he's got a flat tyre. With all due respect to the people currently doing it, this is where drifting really evolved, isn't it? <laughs> Over 35 years ago, that's the way they used to back him in. We're on board with Tilly once more. It's a Ford Fest here into Turn 1. This is a great charge through the pack from Tilly too. Russell Wright on the outside just gives him a bit of room. Tilly showing a lot of speed here. As I said, he started from the back after a, a broken gear shift, and you can see for that puff of smoke, he's pushing very, very hard in the XY GDHO Falcon, oh. sideways under power out of Turn 2. And here's our race leader, Des Wall, still looking those front brakes. This gives an indication of how hard he's pushing this car. Famous car. Loves his muscle cars too, even races a beautiful Chevy Corvette in uh, sports sedan action, so he's always a fan of the big cubes. Jason Tilly, the youngest of the three Tilly brothers, and they all take turns at driving this car. Certainly one of the most famous cars in Group NC Historic Touring Car Racing. Smoke and dust everywhere up ahead of us. The guy's running a little wide. Listen to that 351 cubic inch Cleveland V8. Magnificent sound from these historic touring cars. Oh, how hard we would have pushed the Turan up. Grant Wilson, car 68. Another of the Chevrolet Camaros proving very popular in this category of racing. They were successful in their day. 
And that success has certainly translated to the new millennium. I think that was Scott Bargwana running right there with him as well as we take a look at Wall once more in the Castrol Ford Mustang. There's the battle for second. And look at Stubber. He has come oh. from the back of the pack, can you believe this, to be in contention for a podium finish. Have you ever been in a road car with the guy, Mark? <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise to you at all. There's nothing he does slowly. The West Aussie, a property developer, developing a heck of a lead at the moment over his rivals, if you can catch this man. Incredibly famous car. A lot of people think that Castro Mustang is a replica. It's not, it's the real deal. The Stubber comes hard under brakes. Bianti, in-car camera with Steve Mason. Oh, Stubber! Look at this, trying to get 550 brake horsepower to the ground. <laughs> no wonder the stands are full, Mark. Look at this kind of racing. Well, look at how busy they are on the steering wheel. These cars, they weigh about 1,500 kilograms, somewhere between 550, 600 brake horsepower from these V8 engines, and very, very hard cross-ply tyres that don't help these cars get much power to the road. This is why it's spectacular. Look at this. Nice. This is like a drifting competition, it's not a race. This is fantastic. It's a shame that the word aero isn't limited to chocolate bars <laughs> rather than spoiler <laughs> kits because this is when they really had to manhandle the cars. Fantastic stuff over Corporate Hill and just sliding in and sliding out. Steve Mason's going to be watching in his mirrors too as if he hasn't got enough to look at out the front. Jason Tilly is coming storming through the field in the Green Falcon. So Stubber and Tilly have done a miraculous job to fight their way up toward the front of the pack. But you can see, there is Tilly, just in the background there. So Stubber's done a terrific job. Oh, just locks the inside wheel. He's pushing very, very hard. He's trying to hunt down Des Wall in that famous Pete Gagan Mustang. He's tried all manner of different forms of motorsport, including sprint car racing. So some of this sideways stuff would be not new to him at all. This would be interesting in a straight line. Very, very quick in a straight line, these cars. 5.7 litre engines, highly developed. Very, very quick. Oh. 250 k's in a straight line. Now, what's happened there? They left the door wide open for Mason, who took the opportunity, ducked back into second position. So there's the race lead. Here's the battle for second. And it's going to be a three car battle soon because Tilly is catching the two Chevy Camaros hand over fist. Look at how sideways they are coming out of turn two. Bianchi model cars on board of Steve Mason shows just how Whoop. busy he is behind the wheel. Whoa. You just have to feed the power on so carefully, don't you? Oh, well, they talk about that too, how difficult it is to manhandle these cars, particularly around somewhere like Eastern Creek, which is like a constant radius corner leading into another constant radius corner. The car is continually turning. Oh. The other thing too, I managed to speak to Gary Rush, who's 1971 GTHO, his Bathurst attempting car is out there on the racetrack as well. He said after three laps you generally didn't have any brakes left anyway, so you really physically had to back the cars into the corners to wash off speed. Exactly, that was a technique they had to use back in those days. And the good thing about the regulations for Group NC is they've kept the actual brake size the same as the production car. So that's why these cars start to run out of brakes toward the end of races. And the guys use a lot of sideways motoring to wash off speed. Now, I said Tilly was coming. Jeez, look at, he's there. Now, keep in mind, the yellow Camaro in this car, the Speedy Wheels in-car camera, started off the back of the field, and they have absolutely hammered this field. They're up there now, battling for second place. It's very rare that you'll go past Paul Stubber in this sort of competition, so Tilly's going to give Stubber a big wake-up call. He would be well aware of him. Mason there in the second position. Oh, they straighten up a little bit, knowing that Tilly's behind them this time around. Great battle here. Three American muscle cars leading this race. There's the first of the Aussie ones. The Speedy Wheels, Bianchi, race two. Jason was just saying, the tremendous top-end power this 351 Cleveland V8 has in that Falcon. It just gets beyond 7,000 RPM, and it just wants to keep revving. Oh, and look at Stubber. Stubber. <laughs> wow. That's a fast corner. And he's got that oh, big pulley Tilly. crossed up. Hard under brakes, he gets him too. So the door was open, so he picks up third spot. And he could just about have Mason coming out of here as well. <laughs> oh, Big stuff it. indeed. You can't believe these guys are on bitumen, mate. This looks like dirt. This looks like clay to me. Or ice. Either way. Oh, look at Tilly now. Got him. He's got good power down coming out of that corner. Leaps into second position into turn four. Stubber. Watch for Stubber now on Mason as well. Boy, he did a number on those two Chevys, didn't he? He fixed him up in a space of a few hundred metres. Look out, there's Wall. Cyclone Tilly is on its way. Look at Stubber on the outside here. 
Mindful, respectful, but still hard on the gas. How good is this racing? Door handle to door handle. Stubbers offline on the outside as they come up toward Corporate Hill, but he's hanging on too. You're implying that Paul's off and online, are you? <laughs> he has his own line, the Stubber line. He's certainly got his own, uh, his own distinctive technique of racing, shall we say. Fantastic. It reminds me very much of the old Peter Hopwood days. And the big Impala, oh, yeah. the way he used to back him in, there was a great iconic motorsport car and driver combination. And this is what these magnificent historic touring cars bring oh! back. Oh! Now, he's been having some sort of drama under brakes with this car. We've seen it throughout the race, locking the left and right front wheels. He's gone off at turn 12. Has he got some other problem? No, he's, he's got it fired up. Got to find a gear there. And he's back into, into the race. But it looks like he's struggling. Some sort of chassis imbalance there with the car because... Uh, it's been locking those front brakes pretty badly. Well, it's just made it a whole lot easier for Tilly, hasn't it? Because look at the lead wall has now. Imagine what he had before that mistake. Magnificent car. Competed for five consecutive seasons with Pete Gagan at the wheel. And oh. here comes Stubber. Hello, Paul. Straight line speed from the Western Australian. Look at this. Very, very quick corner, turn one. One of the fastest corners in Australia. And I think Paul Stubber's intention this weekend is to get through it fully oh. sideways. <laughs> I just think back to that start, the way they were weaving through the traffic. That was phenomenal. Fastest to the rear for the next one too, eh? <laughs> Can we dial that one up? What an amazing difference good weather makes as we take a look now at the Shannon's Car Insurance on board and Des. Lucky there was no wall. Oof, straight off the racetrack. Went very quiet then. Installed. Yep, the engine shut it down. He had to fire it up. The rear spares replay takes you right into the... The cockpit of the Mustang. Here is Jason Tilly in hot pursuit of the Mustang. Oh, we've missed What's a couple there. No, I think he's got something more serious than that going on. That sounded like some sort of drivetrain failure to me because the engine just freewheeled all of a sudden like something snapped. And uh, I think he's out. What's he doing? Yeah, he's retiring. Well, broken, broken gear shift in race one. Showed the tremendous speed of the car in race two, but looks like some other drama has taken him out after such a brilliant drive from Jason Tilly to get up to second place from the back of the grid. Well, this man has done it all well, except for a minor episode back there in the previous lap. The beautiful Gagan Mustang, certainly handily steered by this man here, Des Wall, coming down to take the chequered flag at Eastern Creek Raceway in front of a very appreciative and very good crowd. Well, it is amazing we can see this car competing in the modern day. A lot of people think it's a replica, but it's not. It's the real deal. The real car as driven by Pete Gagan. Great job from Des Wall. He's absolutely pumped and there's plenty more. Bianchi, historic stuff coming up later in the program. One of Australia's newest industrial centres is Fisherman's Bend near Melbourne. Not so many years ago, a swamp. Now the centre of manufacture of Australia's first produced motor car, the Holden. Australia's Prime Minister, Mr Chifley, is one of the first to inspect the completed model. That's 1948, but how many have survived until now? We caught up with Phil Monday, who owns one of the oldest cars still in existence, to find out. Holden owned the oldest production car, and uh, that um, is number one, and uh, the one that I have here is number 19. <laughs> they built a lot of them over the years. Uh, in 1948, they built uh, in, uh, 130 odd, and uh, of that, there's most likely uh, about uh, nine surviving cars that are known of uh, at the moment. So it's uh, yeah, quite a, a remarkable car. It's been registered, continually registered since 1948. Um, and uh, yeah, I think they tell me that that is the oldest registered Holden in Australia. Oh, it's good. It's a bit of nostalgia, a bit of history in um, driving these things. They're um, certainly a part of um, part of Australia's history, isn't it? And uh, to get back into driving one of these, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah, the thing that attracted me to them, I think, was my father. Um, he owned them, and uh, we used to wreck them as a kid. <laughs> from wrecking to putting them back together. And a little bit of a yard out here with the cars that we've got, the old ones out here, it's quite amazing because it does remind me a little bit of the backyard back at um, home in Burwood. Last year, Phil and Peter Brock built a race car version of the 48215 from an old car in his junkyard. 
it was like much like one of these that you see laying out here <clears throat> and uh, one day Peter um, uh, came up and said we, we should build one of these cars and, and race it in Goodwood and uh, it was, would have been um, his 61st birthday when he presented me with a painting and uh, he said uh, here's a car this is the FX or the early model he called it this is the early model how about you can build this now and I said PB this would take me three or four months how long does this take you to paint and he goes oh a few weeks and I said okay so you want me just to go away and build this car he said yep so that's how it started I guess um, like most people who met Peter met him at a race circuit then as time progressed I started doing some of his cars for him and um, and from there we built a great friendship and in the in the last couple of years we decided that we'd build up an early model which um, we took to Goodwood in England last year and Peter raced it there so uh, yeah he was um, a great bloke he's certainly an Australian icon and um, um, sadly missed a good good friend yeah. I'd have to say that my favorite car is is the um, early model that we took to England. It holds a very special place in my heart and the memories I have of it are great. And uh, each time I sit in it or look at it, um, it brings back those memories of the fun we had building it and, uh, and the good times we had with Peter. If you too share the passion like Phil does for his 1948 Holdens, remember Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Magazine Summonettes, I welcome you all here to the nation's capital, Drew City. I welcome you to the 20th Summonettes, and I hope that when you go home, that this Street Machine Magazine Summonettes has been incredibly memorable for you. So thank you all for coming, and let's get on with the night's entertainment. Special treat for your ears. Get the cat in the surround, just not to ruin here. Stick here with us, we're gonna take you on a journey to a kingdom ruled by proof. Get the choice to choose a move. The population's all be brain with by the feet. Hypnosis that will start to get to thinking with your face. So step right back and make some room for me today, cause the party ain't been done until I'm there. I tell you why that's the truth. The party don't exist without cats be cruised. So check it where we're going, I should so check it where we've been. Don't ever wanna quit until there's nothing we have seen. Wanna tour the world, we wanna see. All the nations wanna travel around the world, yeah.
devil starts to get the thing with your feet. The population don't remember what's by the beat. The news devil starts to get the thing with your feet. The population don't remember what's by the beat. The news devil starts to get the thing with your feet. The population don't remember what's by the beat. In Melbourne, there's been no such thing as a popular traffic jam. Well, that was until recently, when more than 80 Ferraris rumbled through the city streets, marking the legendary supercar maker's 60th anniversary. Uh, let me tell you about the range of vehicles we have. We have had the oldest Ferrari in Australia, 1951 212, which was the first vehicle imported here by a Melbourneian, in fact, a guy called, uh, called Lowe, uh, right through to a 599, of course, which is the latest model on the market. The celebration is part of a worldwide baton relay in honour of the milestone, and it was organised to coincide with Melbourne's Formula One Grand Prix. The philosophy is to have this baton with a symbol of the 60 best events for the 60 years of our history and to cross worldwide to celebrate properly our 60th birthday. The baton relay commenced uh, in late January from Abu Dhabi and it's been travelling through, uh, through Asia Pacific. It's just arrived in Australia, of course, today. And it leaves from here, goes on to New Zealand and skips across to uh, South Africa. 50 countries, five months, all culminating in the world's biggest party, I promise you, in Maranello at the end of June. The response from the public has been overwhelming. The response from the media has been fantastic. And I've got to say that the support of the City of Melbourne, the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, uh, has just been an amazing thing to, to pull this off in, in such an environment. I think it's a credit to everyone who's been involved. Well, listen, an event, let me say that an event like this was originally set up only in Paris, London, in Italy, in Catania. The response was good, but I think here, what you can see here around is more important. People seem to be really happy, really crazy for Ferrari, and let me say that coming from Formula One world for me, it's like to be in Monte Carlo with the barrier perfectly. I mean, it's like to be in Monte Carlo, really. And just as if it were Monte Carlo, a Formula One car dazzled and deafened fans as it made its way through Melbourne's Italian stronghold in Ligon Street, Carlton. The race car is going to be within probably two metres of all the public and this will be the closest they'll ever get a chance to be to a Formula One car. Um, of course, I guess this is uh, uh, an event of one in ten years, or one in sixty years, if you like that. So it's, it's a special time for them too, of course. It's just so much enthusiasm for the name Ferrari. God damn, whatever it is, I'd love to bottle it. It's fantastic. Cars that compete in most categories of historic car racing in Australia are either genuine cars from the era, recreations of untraceable cars, or officially sanctioned specials, meaning one of a kind, built up from donor parts from the period. There is no official national J and K championship. These cars compete at a state level at a number of circuit, sprint, and hill climb events from February to November every year. Jim Russell is one of the leading drivers in historic racing in Australia, driving his 35 Ford V8 Special in the pre-war J&K class. We're going to follow Jim as he goes through his most demanding year yet in pursuit of his fourth state title while giving you some background to his life in motorsport. Jim Russell, uh, he's one of my real heroes. First time I saw Jim Russell drive was three years ago in that old 1935 Ford with a relatively warmed over, only warmed over, flathead Ford engine.
I've always liked the underdog. And to see uh, a Stumpy Russell go out there in that, maybe I shouldn't say it, but it's sort of an ugly car. <laughs> to see him go out there in that car and beat far, far more sophisticated cars is just fantastic. Uh, he's a great driver. A chap in Adelaide built it in the early 80s and I, I bought it in um, 1990. And, um, it's basically just a 35 Ford and with the body taken off and this aluminium body put on. The 35 Ford was the fourth model of the Ford V8. Launched in 1932, it was the first mass-produced V8. Despite early problems with overheating and unreliability, it was a big hit with the general population and the American bank robber's getaway car of choice. The basic chassis was reasonably light, had good road holding, and the engine could be modified to rev and produce a lot of torque. Henry Ford might not have meant to, but he built a great and versatile car that won rallies and trials, including the Monte Carlo Rally. When chopped down and modified, it won road races, hill climbs, and dirt track events all over the world. Some climb, and I'm not even breathing hard. And it does understeer. It's not very well set up. As you can see, the engine is hanging over the front axle, whereas if you, have a, you, know, if you had a look at most of the other cars down there, you'd find that the engine would be back about, about here, you know. I, I sometimes wonder about Jim's ability to build an engine, you know, he, and, and what he does inside these engines, you know. You, he, he, Jim can make a uh, flathead Ford go extremely fast, and, 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 and faster than a, a lot of the old boys who have been building for a lot of years, you know. Uh, I, I wonder what Jim puts in there, and. Uh, Maybe one day I'll get the peer over his shoulder and find out. In this next story, we learn the art of drifting, or going sideways on four wheels as fast as you can. The phenomenon is taking the motorsport world by storm, so Ford Performance Vehicles developed their own drift car by adding some special modifications to an F6 Typhoon. And as I found out, that was the easy part, because then you have to drive it. Now surely it's a lot better doing it in someone else's car, isn't it? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's bizarre that Ford let, yeah, have let someone go out and thrash their new Pride and Joy, but I guess that's what it's made for. I reckon you're mad. All the racing I do, you don't get the back out, you keep the power down, you keep it smooth and all that sort of thing. So this is really new for me. Just show us a little bit about what happens and how you do things. Okay, sure, Lee. Well, you pretty much try to eliminate understeer. Yeah. That seems to work. The power of the car is obviously important. Uh, definitely. You want a rear-wheel drive car with a bit of power to, uh, to brake traction. Um, if, if you don't have the power, you have to use a couple more techniques of just going fast and really upsetting the car. Okay, talk us through what you're doing. We're kicking the clutch, and then braking into the corner, grabbing second gear, Yay. and uh, onto the grass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's all going pear shape. Yep. Do you just brake or do you just try and spin? Um, yeah, usually full brake, full brake, try and get the car to spin around as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, you end up driving out the back window some of the time, but uh, yeah. No. Okay, wrap it around. <laughs> Now I probably should have asked this earlier. What's the worst damage you've seen happen in, the, in drifting? Um, I've kind of ridden off my two cars. <laughs> <laughs> I um, wish I hadn't asked that. <laughs> Did I tell you I have problems with car sickness, Adam? <laughs> no, you didn't. You were right, mate. <laughs> oh, I'm having a great time. How's your lunch, mate? <laughs> well, I've got both of you out of it. I've had it twice already. Uh. 
if any of you suffer from car sickness, there's really nothing worse than it, is there? <laughs> oh, shh. A project not originally considered by HDT was the WB Magnum, which ultimately became the most popular HDT vehicle not based on the Commodore platform. Based on the Statesman DeVille or Caprice, this was a big luxury car with a new level of performance and handling courtesy of HDT special vehicles. Featuring no body modifications, the car still had the HDT visual makeover, with blacked out windows, body coloured mouldings and new Momo Polaris wheels although not all cars receive these visual enhancements. When it came time to do the uh, Mighty Magnum, Ross McKenzie rang me, who was the then the sales manager of uh, Holden, and I think Crennan was the marketing manager. And uh, they said, yeah, well, look, we, we're trying to get something happening here because the WB is sort of like in run out. And we, there's not much. We haven't got to build them for another year or something, and we've got to try and excite some sort of sales thing here. Can you do something with it? I said, too, right. So they shot out a, uh, I think it was a chocolate brown car from memory, and uh, we looked at that and thought, hmm, okay. Group three heads, group three exhaust, group three uh, carburetor stuff and air cleaner stuff, bit of a snorkel that fitted over here. Uh, got on a Bilstein set of shocks, set of uh, springs, fatter front bar, I think about the same rear. Uh, we fitted, we looked to see what the wheels and tyres, we had a small amount of wheels which were a Momo wheel they had which was like a flush looking wheel, it looked pretty good and also we changed the diff ratio, I think we put a 308 instead of a 278 or something like that. We had about 50 statesmen out the, as soon as GM to, um, announced the demise of the statesmen all of a sudden we had about 50 or 60 of the things turn up we turned them all into Magnum so hang on we've got the Yacht Club out there we've got to deal with. All the chrome had to come off the Statesman's, and it was, I think it was 257 pieces, I think, at last count. And when we did all that, it, the car, or well, we painted bumper bars and did all some, you know, graphics, it, it went hard. I remember going out to Calder, and the best I could do with a stock uh, Statesman was something like 61 and a half seconds on a lap. And as soon as we went out there, we whacked the uh, Magnum out there with its new, I think, that Pirelli P600s on that car. We were down in the 57 dead. It was just like a weapon. And it was only two seconds a lap slower than the actual Commodore around that track. So we thought, geez, the big study gets up and goes. It would have been nice to talk him into a five-speed um, Statesman Magnum, though. Oh, yeah. I was halfway there. Yeah, everything else. So we're putting shots. the five speeds in the group A, it's the same engine. We, all we do have to do is find like a, a manual Monaro console or something and we can put the five speed into a Statesman. That'd be real fly then. Yeah. Because you'd probably find a buyer for it. Because, you know, even if you did one off and see how it went and tested people's reaction, because uh, even the first Magnums, uh, for a statesman, for a very heavy car running all the pollution equipment, they were still very, very quick cars. Yeah, yeah. Super I quick. think they were about a half a second a lap. I think Peter got one around quarter, about half a second a lap slower than he used to get the Almanaros around. And that for a, for a street registered, street driven, what people thought was a yacht back in those days. So. It's amazing what you can do with some Bill Steens and some good springs. Bloody stable, yup. We did three utilities that, that I'm aware of. It wasn't an uh, ongoing model at the time, and uh, we did do specific cars sometimes for customers who come up with an idea they wanted you know, specific work done on the car, which is out, out of our normal model range, and uh, sometimes in between production models, we, we did work like that. So that was a great success. I think we probably built I don't know, 250 or something like that? I don't know for how many exactly. Someone would probably remind me of that, but I think it was quite a, a good seller. And the car itself was a, just a terrific car to drive. I mean, I love those big statesmen. Get back there, just cruise along, you know. That car was a huge success, although once again it was in limited numbers. But point to point, it's one of the best cars I've ever driven. That car just handled so well at high speed. It was well balanced front to rear uh, because of the... Uh, reduced trim height and the wheel and tyre package, it just had a really good footprint on the road. It just had the right amount of understeer and you could really drive it hard and fast. And it's just magnificent to be able to drive a, uh, a luxury car at that speed uh, in complete comfort and complete safety. It was just sensational.
introduced at the 1960 London Motor Show was the Aston Martin DB4 GT Zagato, a car with a style all of its own. We caught up with Paul Sabine, who recently built a replica Zagato from a donor Aston Martin DBS. Originally Aston Martin had the DB4 built by Touring of Milan under a contract and after that they wanted some lighter, even lighter weight cars than the DB4 GT so they went to Zagato and had these cars designed primarily for racing and that's how they built 19 of them originally although there were going to be 23 made but only 19 were made and 19 survived. Each of the 19 cars built were all handmade and subtly different. Changes to the, to the original car really, the, pla the donor platform's from a different model, but the shape of the silhouette of the car is virtually identical. In fact, it's an amalgam of the first car, the first Zagato, and, the, and one of the sanction, what they call Sanction 2 cars, which is one of the last. Unlike the original Zagato, these cars have got 4 litre motors rather than 3.7, a 5 speed gearbox rather than 4 speed and a Dedean rear end rather than the fixed rear end. So they're the main differences and that came about because we're using a DBS platform instead of the uh, conventional DB4 platform which was a little bit narrower. Of course one of the main differences between this and the original Zagato is the better handling, the power steering. It's equipped with air conditioning, but you can't really see it. Uprated interior with nice little fittings, pleated headlining, things like that. To make the car a bit more of a 2000 era car, but still imparting all the qualities of the traditional touring car that Zagato originally made. Paul and his team built these replicas based on a blueprint they created themselves using computer-aided design. We, we commenced this car, first of all, by doing drawings and feeding as much information as we could in. Made a quarter-scale model out of far hard foam, and all that was created on a CAD, which is computer-aided design. And it was actually the first time in Australia, I believe, that a, a whole car was made on a CAD. And that created a foam buck to work from. If you're going to order a car now, it'd be approximately 350 to 380,000 Australian plus the donor car. And the donor car costs between 30 and 50, depending on its condition and what has to be done. We're particularly proud of the fact that we were able to handcraft this car along the same lines that it was built nearly 50 years ago. And the craftsmanship that's required in hand forming this car is quite incredible, particularly all the bright work items, even the glass was made in Australia. If you too share the passion like we do here at the car show, remember Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts.
When I was growing up, my old man said, if you want to invest in anything, invest in bricks and mortar, maybe put your money in the bank, or if you do your homework, put it into shares. Not once did he mention cars, which is a real bugger because we're at the Shannon's Winter Auction and there are two lots in particular we're very keen to follow. One is a 1971 XY GTHO Phase 3. Now it's expected to go somewhere between $400,000 and $600,000. Not bad for an old car, is it? The other one is a two-digit Victorian number plate, number 47. What do you reckon that'll go for? Stick with us and we'll tell you. Over 1,500 people left their bricks and mortar on a cold winter's night in Melbourne to take part in the auction at Shannon's Moorabbin showroom. They came to bid on anything to do with motor cars, motorbikes and memorabilia with the unique and, as mentioned, the rare, all going under the hammer of veteran auctioneer Billy Wellwood. Another man just as enthusiastic and also under the hammer was Shannon's National Auction Manager, Chris Barabon, who introduced the sort after lots. I'm not really not sure you for one of our start cars tonight. It's a 71 Ford Falcon XYG HO Phase 3 sedan. We've been matching numbers. The Phase 3 has been thoroughly checked over by leading and duty experts and is regarded as being a very fair example of this ultra desirable Ford muscle car. F525 once, F525 twice, F525,000 dollars, all finished, all done, F525,000 dollars, all finished, all out, all done, so, 525,000, Recently a similar GDHO sold for $750,000, so you'd almost say 525 grand was a bargain. Not that my old man would be convinced that a piece of metal could be that valuable. However, this next item may change his mind. A very rare opportunity to purchase a significant two-digit Victorian plate. And uh, Bill, what can I say? Let's get on with the bidding and see how we go. At 322000 all finished and done. At $322,000 finished done. That's all the matter. Well done. That's right. You heard correctly. $322,000 for the two-digit Victorian 47 number plates. As Chris explains, there is, for the moment, a demand for most things to do with Australian heritage and muscle car motoring. There are only 90 two-digit plates available in Victoria, so it's a reflection of what has happened to the market, a very mature market now where we're at with number plates and uh, an appreciation for the heritage of these plates. Well, there you go. What an amazing night and a great result. The thing with the number plate which got me was is isn't even a car attached. But then again, you've got to wonder sometimes, don't you? Hey, if you're in for a good night's entertainment, whether you're into the market for a car or a motorbike or memorabilia, certainly keep the Shannon's auctions in mind. It's good entertainment. So remember, if you too share the passion, think Shannon's. Insurance for motoring enthusiasts. The final day of the 2006 Classic Adelaide started early with a wild ride up the narrow and windy Montacute Road and finishing at a special stage around Clarendon. Would Rex Broadbent and Michael Goodyear make it 5x5? Five five? Or could Streck Dale, Richards Oliver or Pai Geelan dethrone the late Classic favourites? And could Sherrard Roberts or Freestone Freestone unseat Catlin Catlin, the current Classic competition leaders? First up a stage with the lot, special stage 25, Montacute. Fast flowing and tight twisty sections combined with tricky corners. Montacute would test even the most skillful driver. What should have been a challenging yet rewarding drive was, for some, just plain challenging. John Felder in his 1930 Oakland 8101 took a wrong turn. While the Wachowskis took their 1977 Holden Tirana A9X for a spin. And the boys on the hill loved it. A 
A total of 16.3 kilometres in length, Montecube was proving to be a physically demanding stage, taking its toll on many drivers. But no more than Weeks Crunkhorn and Beck Middleton. Kevin Weeks and Beck Crunkhorn, who at the start of League 4 were in sixth position for Lake Classic, were now out of the event. Paris Creek, special stage 29, measures 25 kilometres in length, making it the longest stage in the rally. If competitors thought Montague was physically demanding, then Paris Creek would be one damn exhilarating stage. The first challenge, a natural chicane forming an extremely hard left. proved to be a very expensive corner. Graham Bell is a family man, dog lover and Shelby enthusiast. But what is it about the Shelby that Graham loves so much? Shelby, uh, by his own admission, is, is a hot rodder. So he took the Mustang and turned it into a hot rod. He was asked by Ford Motor Company to, to make a Mustang into a race car. Essentially what Shelby did was take a, a, a Mustang Fastback and make them lighter, which they added fiberglass. They took away some of the uh, heavy metal scoop. They gave you an option to delete the back seat. They upped the horsepower of the uh, engine to 306 horsepower or thereabouts. Uh, they put extractors on, uh, electronic ignition. Uh, they lowered the suspension one inch and put the GT um, coils in and uh, a set of Coney shock absorbers. The Ford Motor Company in the US have just brought out a brand new Shelby and Graham was the first to register one in Australia. And I think when Carol Shelby saw how retro this new car was, he got the fire in the belly to say, we need another Shelby because this car is worthy of being a Shelby. You can't have a Shelby without side scoops. They just don't cut it. And in America, uh, everybody's gone wild for the new look, Mustang, the retro look, and all the, all the aftermarket guys are coming out with scoops and spoilers and fortunately they've come out with some side scoops that very much um, do, sort of replicate 1967 upper and lower side scoops so we, we kind of added those to the car at the time of conversion. It's uh, very much a, looks like a 67 uh, fastback, it's, it's got a lot of the Shelby attributes from 67 and 40 years on uh, I think it's a great tribute to the car. Well, it's got a nice note. It's got 500 horsepower. Um, you can spin the wheels in every gear. It's very much a 60s muscle car, reincarnated. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you can't fault it. The uh, Shelbys were in such demand in America. Um, I was on a waiting list from November 05, and uh, when I got told mine was becoming available, I got told the story that Nicholas Cage had got into a Ford dealer and demanded he have one straight away, and he got told to, it'd be on a waiting list like everybody else, and apparently I got mine before Nicholas Cage. But it's not only the actual cars that keeps Graham's interest. He also has a range of collectibles he's acquired over the years. So now I've slowed down a little bit on my collecting because I'm, I'm specifically looking for just Shelby things to collect. Oh, look, there's a bit of a mixture up there. I've got a, um, I've got a book, uh, The Shelby Years, signed by Carol Shelby. I was, I was there when he signed it, so that, you know, I've been to the Shelby conventions over in America, which they have every year. But believe it or not, above all, it's Graham's family that's most important to him. Well, I've got six grandsons. Uh, fortunately, after having three daughters, um, the world smiled on me, and now it's all boys, and uh, so you figure you've got a 
entertain them when they come down the shed and see Poppy and uh, they, they like to hang around and you know the, the, the small cars give them something to play with and grow their interest in Shelby's and Mustangs and um, you know make it fun to come down here and uh, I think one day hopefully my passion will be theirs and I'm trying to work on the theory that I need to leave each one a Shelby when my time's up. <laughs> my wife bought a new puppy recently and decided to call the puppy Shelby as she never got her granddaughter called Shelby. For me as much of the pleasure of driving is showing them off to other people and people really do appreciate seeing them. That's half the fun for me is sharing it with other people. People, passion, um, application, uh, and speed. I treat it like it's mine. I mean, I, I treat it like um, I want the best for it. The car they know they call the walking show. You know, if it had any more fiberglass on it, it would have fallen over. It was unbelievably difficult. 27 different fiberglass pieces went to make up that car and the local industry was not ready for that. From day one, HSB has always created cars that quicken the pulse. In the beginning, it was quite clear we were told we were not to go motor racing, but it took less than two years before they were asking us to go motor racing. Skate Kelly doing? Nineteen years ago, it if I, if I start to think in depth, I really sort of say, boy, we, we really did pioneer things. I have to say that, you know, about 100 cars into the first car we were building, I didn't think we'd reach the 500. Australians have always enjoyed a love affair with the utility dating back to the very beginning of our automotive history. There's no doubt that today, we make cars that are European rivals uh, for half the money. New car launches, it, there's nothing like the, the high of a new car launch, you know, to, to see the baby born and give me the lows of, of two engine problems in the 1995 Bathurst race and then seeing a John Crennan behind the, the pits literally throwing up with anxiety. Uh, I think with HSV we understand the niche so well and we're a spunky small business that does things very well. From day one, HSV has always created cars that quicken the pulse. When you appreciate excellence in motor cars, there is nothing more empowering and exciting than to sit behind the wheel of a high performance vehicle. Underpinning the HSV design philosophy is a clever blend of racing knowledge and advanced road car engineering. And in 1996, this was taken to a new level with the radical HSV VS GTSR. Long before the technical specs or the performance data could be digested, visually, this car demanded attention. No one will ever forget the Stuffit commercial that put this car on the map. Only 85 were built in a small production window between February and April 1996. Yeah, I've done all right, I guess. The business has put the kids through school and looked after mum. Jane and I managed to get away every now and then. I even had a few bob left over last year. I thought about topping up my super. And I decided, stuff that. Life's too short. It brought the rev heads right out, you know. In particular, I always remember, because we had part of that package was to anyone who bought one, we brought them down to have lunch with us. And, uh, and that was a really good exercise. And I'd, I've never got to know so many miners, you know, people from Gladstone in Queensland, people from Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. It, it found a, a specific niche with, with real good, tough Australians who, who, who really would, would see a Porsche or a, or a, or a European car as, as, as a complete anathema to them. TWR's design chief, Ian Callum, treated HSV enthusiasts by loading the car with race-related features, starting with the 5.7-litre stroker engine, a six-speed gearbox, IRS, the premium braking package, 
hydrotrack differential, carbon fibre trims and this rear wing. The car was packed with added extras that represented the ultimate limited edition HSV product for $75,000. The HSV HRT link was further reinforced by offering an HRT engine blueprint upgrade that about one third of the cars produced were sold with a $10,500 enhancement. Try to imagine your typical Australian Yabby as a car. I think it'd look a little something like this. This is the DeVoe Coupe. And just like the Yabby, it's a unique Australian delicacy. It's been romantically styled on the curves of 1930s classics like the Bugatti, Delahaye and Bentley by its Melbourne-based creator, David Clash. I guess the aesthetic quality of, of the early 30s cars um, is, is fairly extreme and, and um, really quite diverse compared to modern cars. Um, they're very expressive and uh, I wanted to capture that sort of expression. David has been designing cars since childhood and spent 14 years as a hobby tinkering away in his garage developing the prototype DeVoe. The first cars used uh, an existing chassis frame uh, which was modified with uh, Jag running gear and uh, from there that frame was um, eventually clad with the shell that was built and um, the interior was then constructed within that. David has since refined that original design and built the first production prototype. This second generation DeVoe is a true blue Aussie inside and out. The car runs straight six four litre motor. It's basically the XR6 motor. All the uh, stuff that we manufacture is made locally. There's a few imported uh, bits and pieces, but uh, it's a good 95% Aussie. It's great. What I love about this car is that it just doesn't have a bad angle. From its tail end to its yabby claw like front fenders. It really is a piece of art. So let's take her for a spin. Now the first thing that you notice, like a true classic sports car, you have to pour yourself into the driver's seat. Absolutely love it. Now the interior mixes old and new impeccably with cream leather, period looking digital gauges, and of course, the old push button starter. The Ford 6 gives the DeVoe a sweet rumble and there's definitely nothing antique about the acceleration. And the driving position in the DeVoe is nice and low. It has that old world sports car feel about it. The first thing you see when you're driving are the beautiful louvers in the bonnet. But the bonnet is huge. By the time you look over the front of it, you're nearly in the next suburb. For a car styled on a 30s classic, the handling is pretty good. A little bit floaty, but you've got to remember it's not a performance car, but overall, very pleasurable motoring experience. Driving this car is like stepping into the spotlight. We've driven Bentleys, Ferraris, Lambos, and not one of them gets as many looks as the DeVoe. David is currently gearing up for a limited production of four cars per year. So for $168,000, you'll definitely be the first in your street to have one. But the future is looking bright, with inquiries pouring in from around the world and plans for a convertible on the menu. And with a recipe like this, the DeVoe, like the Yabby, could become a tasty Australian export.
as yesterday. Kip brings the car there more up into pole position. And now quietly awaits the start. Alan Moffat, second fastest car in practices. And then the national flag in the air and drops and power applied very smoothly and quickly to both cars. But Pete gets the better of it. Jumps away. Let's face it, we all love our cars, and the best way to find out what's happening in the world of automotive engineering is to come to one of Australia's top motor shows. So welcome to the Melbourne International Motor Show. So Mark, tell us about the future of Honda. Well, the future of Honda Glen is very environmentally friendly with this car, the FCX concept car. It's hydrogen powered, it has an electric engine, uh, it seats fall comfortably, it's silent in the way it uh, moves and it's a joy to drive. The mileage is, it has a range of 570 kilometres out of its hydrogen tank. Uh, of course, there's no uh, emissions whatsoever. And uh, as I said, it's a joy to drive. It just feels like driving a normal car, but it's silent. You fuel it up with the home energy station that we have, um, which is uh, converts natural gas into hydrogen, and you can fuel the car at home. And the byproduct of it all? The byproduct of it all is pure water. And surely everyone needs a car with a shy oh, with a sh oh, a shiatsu massage chair in it. Oh. So Brett, tell us, uh, tell us quickly about the, uh, the Roadster. Well it's a, it's a very lightweight three wheel car, I think of it as a car. Uh, you sit in it and it's got a steering wheel, it, uh, in that sense it's it, you know, very much like driving a car. Uh, weighs about 400 kilograms, it's got a, a one litre motorcycle engine in it that puts out about 120 horsepower. It'll do a zero hundred in a, a little under five seconds. And it's, uh, it, perhaps its, its biggest claim to fame is that if you do spin it around, lose, lose complete adhesion, it'll, it'll spin around rather than tip over. Will it go into production? It's, it's certainly my belief is it will. I've had some, some fabulous discussions with a couple of manufacturers just at the show here. And uh, there's one in particular that's, um, that's shown a lot of interest. We've had a, already had several meetings and uh, fingers and toes crossed. So Bill, what is it? This is the new Continental GT convertible, all-wheel drive, and uh, it completes the trio in the Continental range, and we started to deliver these uh, November last year. How much is it? 399500 If I crunch a deal, when can I get it? 
you're looking at around about December delivery at this stage. Well, that's all the time we have, but if you want some inspiration on the next car you want to buy, there's no better place than going to a motor show. I was actually seriously thinking about the F430, but uh, unfortunately beaten to the punch. But let's look at it. I want something European, and I want it in the price range. Fiat Punto. Northern New South Wales town of Mwoolumba comes alive with an invasion of motoring enthusiasts with the sights, smells and sounds of some of the nation's great race cars. From Joe Wilson's 1921 Amal Car CS through to the touring cars of the 70s and 80s, the Festival of Speed on Tweed caters for some of the best historic racing machinery in the world today. The pre-war specials remind us of motorsport from a bygone era. Homemade specials show some Aussie ingenuity up against the best the world has to offer. Some of the best open wheelers from around the world are thrown around the tight layout, being tested to the limits. Brabham's Alphans, March's Lolas and some of the best one-off specials in the world race for the win. Sports cars figure prominently on this Festival of Speed on Tweed program. The best from classic marks such as MG, Lotus, Porsche, Shelby America, Aston Martin, Jaguar and Ferrari battle it out for honours. Smaller capacity four-cylinder tintops show that handling and driver prowess can make up for sheer grunt. Minis battled it out with Escorts, Cortinas, Anglers, Volvos and a hungry pack of pursuers. The big medal in the touring cars came out to play with examples from Ford and Holden going up against Chevrolet and Jaguar's finest. The quickest of the invited cars was the Big Bad Army Reserve XD Falcon of Frank Binding. Another important fact about the festival is that it raises funds for local charities through the Rotary Club of Moolumba. Since the event's inception in 2001, the Speed on Tweed Festival has raised over $100,000 for the local community. Let's check out one of the most talked about cars built in Australia over the last 12 months, the Auto Salon Magazine Hopper. Car Crazy caught up with its creator, Victor Merheb, now for an insight on how Australia's first true hopper was built. Hi, I'm Victor Merheb and this is Project Hopper. Let me tell you about it. Two years ago, I had a dream to build a car that would wow the crowds. I follow a lot of uh, overseas trends and a lot of overseas scenes and a scene that really inspires me the most is the American lowrider scene. From the 1960s onwards, uh, the American lowriders uh, have been building cars to exceptional quality. 
and I found that to be very inspiring to myself and motivating. And I found that they have hoppers which utilize hydraulics to an extreme extent. It took a period of one, one and a half months of planning. I planned the car, basically I built the whole car on paper to begin with, which is a, um, after building a previous ride, I learned my lesson to build the car on paper first so I'll know what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Everything that I've done to this car had to be unique. If I was going to build a car to wow the crowds, not only were the hydraulics important, but the fact that aesthetically the car had to look unique as well. So I didn't want to build to the traditional airbrushing themes and the typical interior themes, or even the, the paint schemes or the wheel themes. Everything plays a part and it plays a role in this car. Everything has a purpose. And the reason why it was put there definitely makes the car what it is. Why wheels essentially are the only wheels allowed to be on a hopper due to the fact that they are the strongest wheel on the market. There were other options in terms of billet wheels or, I mean, obviously chrome wheels, but the minute I do jump and land, the wheels have a, um, there's more, more, more chance that the wheels will buckle. With a, a minimum of 80 spokes, these wheels won't buckle. The front tires though, if you'll have a look, They do seem a little bit overweight. Reason being they are bloated due to the fact that they're running at 60 PSI. Normal street pressure would be about 35 to 38. We run them at 60 PSI to help with the uh, getting the car up in the air and I'll explain that later. The window etching is something that they do very big in the US. And in fact, they do glass engraving. So this is still one step behind, but we're getting there. At the front, I've given them the name of the car, the hopper, with a little bit of a design on the edge. The car is obviously not driven on the road, it's a dedicated hopper for the shows, so there's no need for the car to be... Obviously that would not be done on the street car because you're blocking your view, but for the shows, why not? Anything can be done. The airbrushing was performed by Wayne from Advanced Airbrushing in Sydney. The theme throughout the airbrushing, I didn't want to go with a uh, traditional lion or dragon or, or just female with water or, or something like that. I wanted to uh, bring a different culture to, to the scene. Again, following from the, um, my counterparts now, which I can call them, in the US, the Mexicans have a strong belief in, in detailing their life story or the reasons why they built their car. I don't want to go into too much detail because I think the picture enough says enough, but the girls, Myself being number one, and the car itself are the reasons why I built the car. I fulfilled a dream by building this car, and I put the portrait on the bonnet. The interior, very red, very red. Um, all I can say is Master Auto Trim, being Louis himself and Cha, worked magic. What you see here is a whole two rolls of crushed velvet double layered because it is very thin. Sections are buttoned and wrinkled. We performed every sort of um, feature within the car. If you look at the roof, for example, even the roof has been done in button and pleated. And now for the fun part, the hydraulics. Let's have a quick look at what makes this car so special. Marine batteries, motors, pumps, basically the hydraulic system. You've got all your plumbing, dumps, solenoids, compressor, and oil catcher. Rams. In theory, hydraulics look cool, they sound cool, and they make you cool. Look at me. And my best friend, the switch box. This is the controller that, that controls the car. Having a long enough suspension for me to stand far away from it while it moves. And the last bit to this is explaining the pump dump theory. Our switches for back, front, side to side, but effectively the pump and the dump. Now the car's already been pumped up. Let's dump it back down and pump. 
For the front, as I said before, running 72 volt, the pump dump theory is a lot faster. When you pump and dump, you get this. I'd like to thank all my sponsors for helping me create what I believe has been a big show for 2003 Auto Salon. Special Intake Auto Salon Magazine, Maguire's House of Colour, Master Auto Trim, MFX, Federal Performance Tires and Queen Street Smash Repairs and Advanced Airbrush for all the effort they've put in. The biggest thanks to Tubular Suspension Systems for doing all the work on the hydraulics and travelling around with me. Without James at uh, TSS, I wouldn't have got this car finished in time and Thank the public for applauding every time I put on the show. Trivia fans who enjoyed watching Get Smart would recognise this car as being a Sunbeam Tiger. But would you believe that the Sunbeam Car Company in 1927 built the fastest car on earth and that Malcolm Campbell set speed records in a Sunbeam rebadged as the now famous Bluebird. And would you believe they didn't make kitchen appliances? Well, it's true. As is the passion, members of the Sunbeam Car Club of Victoria have for these cars referred to as later fin alpines. Oh, I like the alpine, it's well finished, it's a robust uh, type of car. Uh, it's well finished inside. This is a Series 2, but this is unique in, in so far as most of them are red. Um, I've particularly gone out of my way not to make it a concourse car, but more or less to make it a, a touring car that, that I enjoy. Well, this one's uh, basically um, as it was off the line. I've put a later model engine in it. This has actually got a 1725, and with the transistor ignition, it's uh, very smooth very smart car to drive. That's a pleasure to be able to drop the soft, soft top down and have open driving, particularly on the country roads. It's very enjoyable. This is the Harrington. That was commissioned by the Roots Group who made the Sunbeams uh, by a company called Thomas Harrington to build a special fastback Sunbeam Alpine to run in the 1961 24-hour Le Mans race. So this is what they call a stage three Hartwell engine. It's got the weaver, side draft weavers, a bigger capacity, light and flywheel. It just revs better, goes harder. Um, still doesn't stop as well as they should. There's only four of these in this whole country. So four Hampton Le Mans. So they are amongst the very rare breed of car. The Sunbeam Tiger was my ultimate and uh, I always wanted one. And one came up for sale in South Africa and uh, I couldn't help myself, I bought it and bought it over here and, uh, and I've just spent a labour of absolute love on the car. Carol Shelby was approached and uh, shoehorned a, uh, a small block Ford 260 cubic inch Windsor uh, engine in the car. I've uh, used slightly wider wheels on it to give it a bit better road holding uh, as well as the brakes and uh, it is very good with modern traffic. It's a full uh, convertible. There's nothing like wind in the hair and uh, it's just very exhilarating of a, uh, uh, of a nice, pleasant day, a day like today. It's something that I really enjoy to go out of a Sunday afternoon and I go out for a, you know, for a Sunday drive. If you too share the passion, like these guys do for sunbeams, remember Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts.